I'm not sure if I hear you all now. Okay, and do you want me to just start, Annette? Um, sorry, um, Clara? Okay. Okay. So, good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, everybody. Um, it's really a, a great pleasure for me to be back on Virtual International Day of the Midwife and to be able to present to you the Lancet series on midwifery. Um, it's, it's been an interesting uh, three, four years in, in, the, in the making, and uh, two papers are still being completed as we, as we speak. So um, bear with me as I go through the presentation. There are quite a number of slides, many of which I won't um, kind of discuss in detail, but just have there so that you can read for yourselves. Um, so the series has really um, put out and, and provided an evidence base that shows that midwifery is a vital solution. And that vital solution is something that many countries, many um, uh, development agencies, and obviously women and families um, are needing and are looking for. So we're very pleased that um, we have now the opportunity uh, and, and the evidence base to show what makes the difference and why it's so important. So I just wanted to start out with a context within which we're discussing this at the, this point in time. Um, as you all know, we're at the end of the Millennium Development Goals. They'll be ending at the end of this year. They started in 2000. So we've had 15 years of uh, high level focus and financial focus as well on uh, two Millennium Development Goals that are specifically interesting for our area of work, which are the maternal health one to reduce maternal mortality and the uh, child health one, which includes reducing the death of newborn children. Now, those are, of course, for some areas in the world more important than for others. But the series was written for the entire, for all countries, for the entire population. So moving from the um, Millennium Development Goals, we're now looking at the developing and agreeing the sustainable development goals. And those will go way beyond what was in the MDGs. They're going to be including not only issues around health and education and, and poverty reduction, but they're also going to be looking at sustainable development, at economic empowerment, at gender equity, um, and at human rights. So they're, they are much, much larger, and there will be 17 of them as opposed to the eight that were in the Millennium Development Goals. So within the whole portfolio of activities, um, health is going to only be one among 17 goals in, in, instead of at least half of the Millennium Development Goals. And within health, uh, maternal health is going to be a part of the entire health goal. So you can see how the focus is going to set, seriously change, um, which makes a lot of sense because, you know, if we don't have a planet, we don't need maternal health to be really kind of direct and blunt about it. In addition to that, there's uh, on, in the health arena a push for universal health coverage, which means everybody should have access to quality services that don't make them lead them to bankruptcy. So they, that that has a um, that that works very much in our favour or in the favour of maternal health because it's one of the one of the you know standard things that are always covered in these uh, in these kind of universal health packages. Um, but it also, again, dilutes the focus that used to be or, or has been quite exclusively on maternal health and maternal and newborn health into a wider set of, um, a set of issues. And then on top of that, um, uh, there's a revision of the UN Secretary General's Global Strategy for Women's and Children's Health. So that's a focused piece that's been put in place to help achieve the Millennium Development Goals 4 and 5, and it's being re thought and redeveloped and strengthened and again broadened so that it, that it will be a continuation under the um, Sustainable Development Goals and there will be an add-on uh, add of adolescence. So it will be this global strategy for women's, children's and adolescent health. There's also a global strategy for the health workforce. So um, the WHO Workforce Department is, has developed uh, is developing a strategy to, together with the Global Health Workforce Alliance to really un make people, make countries, make development agencies, make donors understand that there is no health without a health workforce. So uh, that is actually going to strengthen 
um, a large in a large part the global strategy, but also the sustainable development goals and specifically the one on health. There's an increased focus on quality of care. We've had accessibility, people needed to be able to get to care, so there's there have been ways to make that easier. They've needed it needs to be acceptable. So there's been a lot of work uh, done, for example, around respectful um, care ch during childbirth. Um, and it needs to be affordable, um, but it, the, the quality of care is always the most difficult one and it's dropped off the, uh, off the radar for a while, but it's now back with a vengeance and I think that's really, really glad, really good. So within that, we need to really, really understand very well what the realities are of women and children and make sure that um, we make that, that what we're delivering and how we're working really fits with their needs rather than what a health system needs or what the financial uh, capacities are. So there's a, these are just a couple of examples of the of the big initiatives that we've had to date. This is the MDG 456 uh, activity which brought together maternal newborn health and HIV AIDS and um, there, there are very many of these kinds of initiatives that have happened. We've had launches of an Every Newborn Action Plan, of the Countdown to 2015, information about 75 countries, low, low middle income countries. Um, and then, for example, Saving Mothers' Lives. Um, all these initiatives and these foci have created good progress and, uh, and um, results, but there are still enormous differences and there are uh, countries where it seems that we're still just a there's still just a drop that we've been able to do and the two we mentioned here are uh, India and Nigeria but there are many others uh, that are, are you know not as large as India and Nigeria and still facing enormous difficulty so we also need to make sure that in the sustainable de development goals we're more focused we're more pushed towards what the different needs are. So these numbers will probably not be very uh, strange to you. You'll probably have seen them repeatedly. Um, and uh, I think the important thing is that um, we're now been through the quality of care lens, moving not only to look at maternal deaths, but also at morbidity and specifically um, at well-being and satisfaction and the strength and the, and the building of capabilities of women as they go through pregnancy and childbirth to take care of themselves and their families. So the challenges that we're seeing, and, and uh, we've talked about some of those already, um, are quite large, and they, excuse me, and they have, um, we've talked about some of these as, uh, already, but the longer term, the one in the middle, psychosocial and cost effectiveness outcomes that have not been taken into consideration have been specifically um, addressed in our series. We really know that and, and we've compared and you'll hear later on how that's happened. Um, we've looked at lots and lots of studies um, looking at what are the psychosocial um, and, and the cultural impacts and, and effects of um, pregnancy and childbirth on women and um, you know doing a cesarean section really um, is not the best option and is definitely shouldn't be proposed as the only option which is happening in more and more places in the world at this point in time. And there have been lots of responses to this. A lot of people have kind of thought, so, you know, doing midwifery is actually a little bit too complicated because it takes a long time to educate them and they're expensive and all those kind of things. So let's just do emergency obstetric care or let's put everybody in um, facilities or let's make sure that we have emergency uh, uh, availability or let's just train a community health worker. But in principle, um, the, the, the thing that we should have done, and if we'd done it in 1987 when the Safe Motherhood Initiative started, um, would be to implement and to, to strengthen midwifery and midwives around the world. So there are a lot of essential um, elements needed for saving lives. So it's not only the workforce, it's not only the midwife. I won't read them all out to you, but you can see what are, what are other things that need to be focused on. Um, but the challenges then for the series, which is really what I'm going to talk to you about now, are the, the different kinds of countries that we needed to address, um, the, the very limited uh, numbers of studies that were available, um, needing to focus on women and newborn and infant or into their early, early weeks, months, years of life, uh, and again, not just hospitals and healthcare providers, balancing mortality with morbidity and well-being, 
presenting midwifery and midwives, trying to find, kind of untie those knots around what those two are um, and seeking collaboration and consensus with other disciplines and with international organisations. And we had several rounds of review of the papers by um, other disciplines, um, obstetricians, gynaecologists, um, nurses, paediatricians, and international organisations like WHO and UNICEF, and UNICEF and UNFPA. Um, because we wanted to make sure that once the series came out, they would all kind of back it and, and work with us to make it available widely. And then, of course, there are also the challenges for midwives, and many of you will recognise these. Um, over medicalization, you know, the, the ease with which um, people just kind of decide that they will, they will have a cesarean section, um, but also things like an unsafe working environment, places where midwives can't safely go from where they where they're staying or where they're spending their night as they're on call to their to the facility where they should be working. Um, uh, and, and limitations to the practice of things that they can do are not are, are sometimes covered in regulation, but that doesn't translate into anything real. real. So the series started and, and kind of came to the conclusion before it started that the only way to address these issues would be to start out with from the basis of women and their children and families. So we couldn't say we were going to be describing what the midwife does or how important midwifery is without starting from what this is all about and why we're doing it. We used a human rights based approach, we used loads of different sources of evidence and we used all relevant outcomes, so survival, but also health, well-being, creating health, maintaining well-being, strengthening capabilities, also very important, the different kind of income settings, quality care as well as service provision, and all these different kind of perspectives that we talked about earlier. We needed to specifically talk about the value and the importance of integrated services, as difficult as that sometimes is, because there is a lot of, uh, you know, there, there's, there can be a lot of strife and difficulty in these, in, in these uh, teams of mixed teams of professionals working together. But really, the only way to secure the continuum of care is if people play and do their part um, to the, their full competence. And then at the end, we examined the specific contribution of midwives using the ICM competencies. So the first paper was um, led by Mary Renfrew and it's called Midwifery and Quality Care. And I won't, you'll see that there are lots and lots of sources of evidence. So, so if the total number of studies is, is around 800, if you add up these numbers. Three big case studies that we looked at specifically to be able to tease out some of the issues in middle income countries with growing, star starkly growing economies and then competence, ma mapping the competency of the midwife. And that led us to um, a framework for quality maternal and newborn care. And this framework at the top lists out all the kind of practice categories, all the things that we do as we provide care to, to women and their, uh, and their families. Um, so moving from education and health information through assessment screening, to the promotion of normal processes and, and also first line management of complications. So those are the things that we all think and that have that we've you know that we do and that we know and that are visible. But beneath that, there are several other important areas that need to be, needed to be addressed in our series and that kind of came out of the work that we were doing. And it, one of those is how care is organised so that where there are enough work for there's enough workforce there's enough equipment, that there is a continuity in that there, uh, from both from household to hospital, as well as um, uh, from, from one group of service providers or care providers to others, and along the, the life course and, and the course of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, and then there are the values that, that really kind of need, that all people that are working in the area of uh, maternal and newborn health and need to provide not only midwives but everybody else, which are respect to communicate openly and fairly, to understand um, what women need and where they come from and what their background is and how their cultural and, and religious and social circumstances can be and how that can influence their decisions. And then one of the ones that's most important to me is the philosophy, which is about optimising normal, physiological, psychological, social and cultural processes that then strengthen a woman, that give her in this one special period in her life uh, the capacity to, to learn and to learn her, to, to get to know herself and her strength. 
and uh, to take care of herself later and her family. Um, and then that we do that, or we've, we've kind of put that in the words of expectant management, using interventions only when indicated. And the last piece that we discussed or, or looked at in the series are the practitioners who should who could be doing and should be doing this work, because of course it's not only midwives, there are a lot of others that need to be providing care as per this framework. So then you see that in that, in the blue card here, that um, you know everything except the, the highly technical medical obstetric and neonatal services can be and are provided by midwives. So there is a large number of outcomes that are improved by midwifery, and you can find a much fuller list of that um, in the in the series itself, and specifically on the web annex. I won't uh, read them all out to you, um, but there are uh, there, there is also a um, a good uh, value for money um, analysis that was done and is recorded in paper four that shows that investing in midwifery really gives value for money. The numbers of cesarean sex in, sections avoided and lives saved um, from a group of midwives in Bangladesh over their 30 uh, year career shows a 16 fold return on investment. So the, the numbers, if you turn those cesarean section saved and lies saved into numbers, you get a, a, a return on investment that is 16 times what you put into their education program. So then we had, we came up with defining midwifery, which is the thing that we do rather than the person that we are, as skilled, knowledgeable and compassionate care for childbearing women, newborn infants and families across the continuum and with core characteristics that include, as I was saying, optimizing normal biological, psychological, social and cultural processes of reproduction and early life, intervention management of complications, consultation and referral, respecting women's individual circumstances and views, and working in partnership with them. So those are, are the things that, uh, that we also then have the evidence base for. The, the, the research that has been done shows that these are outcomes that women value and that midwives can deliver and that midwifery can deliver and should include. So in essence, that this paper really means that we need to, to change our, our thinking, that we need to, sh to shift things, not just individually, but as a whole maternity care system, away from looking at um, pathology and interventions and uh, and moving towards skilled midwifery care for all. So everybody um, should have access and, and should be provided this kind of, of care before um, any, any interventions uh, get discussed. So then the second article took um, the list of interventions, essential interventions that have been set up by the partnership for maternal newborn and child health um, and the Live Saved tool and looked at 78 low income countries to estimate the value or, of or to see what the, the impact is of midwifery on uh, the number of lives that could be saved. And again, this is the, the language that um, is used a lot in the international development arena. The list tool is used a lot. So those are things that people can relate to. And we use those international, those essential interventions and put them next to the um, the competencies of the midwife uh, and we uh, and the um, the definition of the midwife. So we used ICM as the basis and had the essential interventions next to that, and that um, kind of showed that um, if, for example, we had a, a small increase in midwifery, including family planning. So, for example, a country would have 10% more access to midwifery. Maternal mortality would already reduce by 27%. And if you see then, if we could increase the number of midwives or, or the way midwifery is provided, <coughs> by 25%, maternal mortality reduces by 50%. And if we get universal coverage, which is 95 to 100%, maternal mortality reduces to 82%. And those um, uh, we can reduce maternal mortality by 82%, and those reductions are the same for stillbirth and neonatal birth. So this was a very important paper, so that that would ha that helped us um, show that there is a value and an impact, um, which of course a lot of us know, but you need to be able to to make it visible. So these are the same numbers again, 
Um, contribution of family planning in that was included because it is important. Of course, you know, if there are less pregnancies, then of course there is, there is less death. <coughs> Um, we we put in a special uh, we you know we added on a specific area where we looked at the effect of, of the specialist, and um, we looked also at the impact impact of preventative measures. So it wasn't only um, looking at the interventions; there were also preventive measures in there. So the conclusion is that in principle, the you know matern um, maternal maternal uh, newborn and stillbirths can be um, reduced significantly, specifically in low middle income countries, um, and that midwife as a healthcare worker can really effectively and efficiently deliver the entire package of interventions. And that has a lot of impact on regulation, of course. Then the third article, and I'm afraid that my slides are not complete for this article, was to look at, so in countries where um, maternal mortality has been reduced and it has been done by midwives. What happened? How did they do this? And are there ways that we can learn lessons from what's happened um, in those countries? The lead author on this was uh, Professor von Leerberger, and um, it, they, they really looked at country experience first and foremost. So they showed that, oh, sorry, there should be something coming in here. Okay, there should be a table here which is uh, not visible that shows that um, increasing access to facility birthing in those countries actually was one of the large components of reducing maternal mortality. And the second picture that you should have had in here, and, and I don't know why it's not here, I'm, I'm, I apologize for that, is to show that in the, in the court countries that we, that kind of came out with um, having successfully imp implemented midwifery to reduce maternal mortality in their Burkina Faso, Morocco, Indonesia, and one more. They had a, a similar sequence. So it all started with bringing a out further, giving better access to a network of healthcare facilities, not only focused on maternal newborn health, but on all other things. And the second, um, issue that, or the th second thing that happened in those countries was to reduce the financial barriers. So to make sure that there was, uh, that women could um, easily and without a lot of, uh, you know, without to having to sell the family uh, house or, or something big, access services. Chris, do you have a hand up? I can't see that. Um, and then uh, the the third thing that happened is um, that they then start then they kind of expanded the numbers of midwives and only at at the last um, the last of the four issues was that they looked at um, quality of care. So the facilities, the kind of easy not easy things to do, but the kind of tangible things to do happened first. The facilities came out, um, the financial barriers were decreased, um, the, the midwives became more accessible, and people started looking at quality of care. And I think that's an important sequence to keep in mind. So, um, just see which one is. So this means, and uh, uh, that the out, was the outcome of the third paper, <coughs> is that it's important to continue to talk at a national level about what women and care seekers need and the quality that they expect, and to um, focus and, and make sure that the uh, optimizing processes and the physiology of pre pregnancy and childbirth are at the heart of that. They're, they're, they're part and parcel of that discussion. We elaborated in the fourth paper, um, which is the paper that I led, uh, what the investment case is for education, uh, the education and recruitment of midwives. And that's what I explained to you earlier, that investing in 30 midwives, uh, sorry, 500 midwives over a 30-year career 
um, gave a 16 fold return on investment, which is enormous. Um, and, and though it was, uh, you know, only in one country, uh, those are interesting uh, and, and well founded pieces of work to use to, to make the case. Now, that means that education, um, a regulation and the development and strengthening of competencies um, need to be pushed further into the area of quality of care. And one of the things that we've been doing with, an, um, with the International Federation of Midwives um, is develop a midwifery services framework. So a framework, a stepwise approach in which countries can strengthen and, and push in uh, for what midwifery should be or how, how midwifery services can be sorry can be strengthened my, my voice is starting to go so I'm going to rush a little bit more so the the end of our presentation uh, and the end of our, our series really show that um, that midwifery has contributed to the Millennium De Go Development Goals and will contribute and should contribute more to the Sustainable Development Goals and it is at this point in time in many areas and in many of these strategies and, and uh, action plans um, a core element. Um, making sure that all midwives can provide family planning specifically in high mortality areas is extremely important um, and then making the <clears throat> the economic case for uh, midwifery services continues to to be a, an element that we should further develop but that we really um, uh, have very good and strong evidence for. So to conclude that the services um, that need to, that we provide or that midwifery sh services should be providing uh, should be responsive to the needs uh, of women and infants and and that's really 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 a different um, of way of looking at the way that we've worked and that we're working now and it should be in all countries not just the developing countries that we're we've been working with um, a lot in these development programs and um, that means that there are a lot of system that systemic barriers health systems but also education systems barriers that need to be addressed and that women in communities need to be included in that discussion. Um, and then just to say that there are two more papers that are going to be uh, coming out that belong to the series even though they weren't ready by the time that the, the first four were launched and one of those is being led by Holly Kennedy who was just speaking before me and that's on the research agenda for midwifery. So the investment is needed in relevant research and, and we're writing a paper on what that relevant research would then be. And the last paper is a paper on the QMNC, the Quality Maternal Newborn Care Framework and um, the human rights. So how does it strengthen human rights and how do human rights strengthen it? So I think that we've got a, a, a large, strong series here. It's well evidenced and well evidence based. Um, it's completed and supported by people from all over the world from large numbers of different um, disciplines and professional groups and categories. So this is something that uh, there is an executive summary for which is also available online and that you can work with uh, to strengthen the case for yourselves. Um, so I could like, I'd like to hand over to Jon to take on the section about midwives for all. Thank you Petra. Um... I work with the Swedish Foreign Ministry for, uh, or the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Stockholm with communications and public diplomacy. So I come from a completely different field than uh, than health and, and uh, investigation. But Sweden has a long tradition in in working with midwifery, with midwifery, and long, long, strong history of midwifery. Uh, and, and also through its uh, development cooperation has invested a lot in training of midwives and uh, various different uh, programs to support midwifery worldwide. And from our point of view, working with the field called uh, digital diplomacy, which tries to use the potential of the, the transforming uh, communications landscape where, where digital and social media and uh, the new connections and networks that, that uh, uh, 
uh, are the result of, of, of this digital revolution make it possible to reach out in new ways? We have identified this this very topic as a, as as a, a, an important one to support, and uh, we also think that it's a, a, a topic where Sweden can contribute. Uh, thanks to the long traditions that we already have in this field. So when the Lancet uh, series came out last year, we noticed that and, uh, and, and started to work around the campaign called Midwives for All. And we started with the very name of that, uh, as, as it is suitable for communications in, in social media. And we reached out to the team behind the Lancet series with Petra and Mary and have been in close conversation throughout the process and, and designed a campaign on our side together with our embassies and other stakeholders. So, uh, as I just explained, uh, we, we think it's crucial with, with uh, an evidence-based practice and we think it's crucial to use the new technology to reach out and create engagement in new ways around the, the, the science that supports uh, the midwifery practice um, and and we want to contribute to the rising movement of global midwifery through through working as a connector between various fields and and uh, and uh, this is actually part of this we this online conference is a very good example of how 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 communication technology makes it possible to connect around around uh, evidence like this. Uh, what we can also do is to add our own networks into this field and and have a, a different completely different angle than 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 some of the health experts might have because we come from from our um, field of foreign policy and might identify different opportunities uh, which which is good if if you want to uh, make an impact uh, so we started thinking when, when uh, the Lancet report came out on the state of the world's midwifery and, and worked throughout the autumn and then we launched a campaign in, in uh, Geneva in February at a conference with uh, seven, seven different foreign missions and the WHO was there and UNFPA and the ICM. Um, and the, we, then we launched this web page where we tried to source best practice and uh, also direct experiences from people who who have different stories to share about the benefits of midwifery in various uh, ways and that's an ongoing project that we, that we have that we we try to uh, use to reach out with content about midwifery in the whole world not least in low and middle income uh, countries and and uh, uh, this is kind of the uh, uh, basis of, of, of the campaign. But we have also uh, engaged with various different nodes as we believe that everything is almost like large network now. So we, we are not partners but more uh, nodes in the same network and we, we support the same uh, uh, philosophy. And here are some of, of these nodes and we have also engaged our own nodes that are our embassies. The, the um, uh, actual campaign has had this reach. Uh, we, we have reached over 3 million uh, people on Twitter and we've got the, had, had many people uh, joining the conversation. And then we have a, a long side designed uh, co-creative events with our embassies and on, 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 on our own together with uh, the Lancet team and at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in March. And we have asked our, our embassies to do what we, are self, what, what we are trying to do ourselves, which is to do something on platforms where you're not normally plat, uh, uh, present, together with, with stakeholders that you don't normally work with. Because we think that midwifery, as well as many, many other kind of similar topics, could benefit from unexpected collaborations and, and that will in, in turn create some extra attention but also help spreading the knowledge and, and creating more engagement and 
thus increase demand for these services, we hope. So the theory of change would be that we as a foreign ministry can help keeping this topic high on the agenda and help driving more uh, engagement to the field of maternal health and newborn health. And uh, in, in one of the examples of this campaign was in Uganda where they have been collaborating with the First Lady but they have also reached out in, in, in local languages through radio. In Angola they are collaborating with a, a music group to, to work around uh, 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 this topic. And, and we have another campaign coming up on, on, on the 5th in Bangladesh and so forth. So that these are kind of specific events. And at the same time, our, our foreign minister wrote an article on the launch or on the 8th of March in, in the Huffington Post. So uh, this is summing that part up, really, that we try to collaborate in various ways through our networks. And here's an example of the press that we have got in Uganda. And it's really interesting to see what happens when, when people reach out and connect in new ways because this is a specific result of, of that instruction really to, to move out of your own uh, comfort zone and, and do something around the topic that you uh, want to, to highlight and, and raise awareness about. And we just came back from Washington DC where we took part in a, in a panel on um, uh, campaigns for social good together with the campaign He for She, which is a UN run campaign where men support women's rights and, and, and so forth. And that's also a kind of an example of how, how a campaign can, like this can reach out with an agenda in new fields and create a discussion around this, uh, this specific uh, uh, agenda. And, and we hope that, that uh, we can evaluate soon and, and be able to see whether we have been making any substantial contribution to this movement, but we definitely hope that the engagement from our side and our ministers and so forth at least keep, helps keeping this, this, uh, this uh, topic on the agenda. I think that's me. And we always look for for contributions uh, from, from different stakeholders. So short texts and, and even films from, not least from the field, you know, where people are trying to do something new about the benefits of midwifery. So you're all welcome to contact us and also suggest other forms for, for collaboration and also cross tweet and use the hashtag in any ways that you find suitable to, to uh, share knowledge really. That's, that's I think the core message that we have, that we need to spread best practice knowledge and not least the evidence as, as such, uh, presented in the uh, Lancet series. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that. And we'll just open up the floor for some questions. I think there's a lot of positive feedback about the Lancet series. I know that many of us have used that to support our evidence-based practice. And um, yeah, and Lynn points out it is about spreading the word, spreading the word. Join Twitter, Facebook. Use those hashtags and um, get these things out there. I think you've just recruited a lot of people there, Jon. Well, that's, that's good to hear. I managed to do that. <laughs> yeah. So I put a link to the website up and uh, you can just follow that. There's also a Facebook page you can like and um, they're on Twitter, so just start using those hashtags. And Petra's also put up a link, I see, to the Lancet series. It's in interesting with the Lancet series that it's being translated now into various languages. It's in French and coming out in Portuguese. And I think that, that in itself, the, the evidence in the series uh, being translated is, is a very good thing to work around because currently some countries have a very active debate about this. But in many places you still need to reach out, so I think that's a very good opportunity to start doing things around the evidence um, and, and, and getting the discussion started in, in with 
policymakers in in various countries. Mm, and making it as it makes it accessible as well for midwives in every country, so that they can access it and read it in their own language, and it's for free, which is wonderful. It is free, isn't it? So I, I think one 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 problem that we see is that we need to engage uh, finance departments, we need education departments, and other parts of the political system to to highlight this this field and and having the evidence as a basis for that is very crucial but also having platforms that that make create new access into into this topic for more stakeholders and i think that's what we aim to to do with our project and and i see that there are various initiatives doing the same thing in 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 some ways but uh, i think that we better a lot from collaborating even more broadly around this. Okay, so last call for questions. I think, Petra, would you like to say anything, add anything? Just to say what, um, what working with Midwives for All has really uh, done for the series, um, and it's it's given us the opportunity to uh, to think also a little bit differently around uh, about what the series means and how it works and, and the things that we could do to make it more accessible and to build a momentum for it from it. And um, we, we had what they call what what Jons calls an, an adiathon in New York uh, in London a couple of months ago uh, weeks ago and. We came up with some really interesting and new ideas are about how to award people for the work that they're doing in rural areas and give that extra uh, publicity um, and therewith also uh, just talk about the practice rather than only the evidence base uh, and make the make the Lancet series really applicable and and kind of part of life rather than this thing that's in in a very um, you know, high-level medical journal. So it's really kind of made it more pop popularized uh, the series and and given people opportunity to to send in their thoughts and their support or or the or their questions uh, around what what the series means and what it's done. So to me, if it, it's a it's a wonderful way to to share and to bring together um, different groups of or different areas of of interest, different um, points of view. Um, so the other thing that would be great is if you um, would be interested in sending us a blog um, of maybe of what you've experienced today on the virtual IDM day or, um, you know, or, or, or just other things that you're experiencing um, with regard to midwifery and midwives um, in your day to day and, and send them to the, to the midwives for all website so that they can go up. That would be great. And thank you all very much for your, for your attention, for spending time with us today. Thank you so much for, for me as well. Yeah, and thank you so much. It's been just absolutely wonderful, and we've got some really great feedback coming through. Um, you know, all on the Lancet series. It's just, I think, yeah, it's just been absolutely wonderful. Okay, I'm going to just run through the last few slides. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I don't think I'm going to turn off record, but if you do have any photos of yourself, please upload them onto Facebook, share them on Twitter, we'd love to see you, or email them through to admin at vidm.org. Um, thank you for attending. Please feel free to download a certificate of attendance and fill out our feedback form. We would love to know what you thought of this conference. And I will now be handing over. I'd just like to echo uh, Sarah's plea about the feedback survey. It's really important to us that we get your feedback so we can work out how to make next year's conference better than this year's. Um, so definitely your thoughts on what you've, uh, what you've uh, seen and taken part in over the last 24 hours. Uh, we're definitely interested in what you think we can do to uh, increase attendance because that's something we like to do year on year. So if you have any, any ideas about that, please include that too.
Hi there, it's, um, it's Deborah Davis here, Professor of Midwifery in Canberra and 24 hours ago I was opening um, this e-conference and the can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, and the time's just absolutely flown and I've, I've seen some people in the audience here who I know were here uh, most of yesterday and here again early this morning for Australia anyway. So I'd just like to bring the e-conference to a close. Um, first of all by thanking our organising committee who I know have put in an enormous amount of hours to bring this to you. Um, and are absolutely committed to it and we get re-energised every year after we've done it because we just feel so inspired by the, uh, the comments of the attendees and also by the amazing presenters. To everybody who presented and put in an abstract, it has been an absolutely fabulous program. It covered so many different topics from nutrition and clinical practice through to the bigger picture um, that we've just had in this wonderful presentation. So thank you to everybody. And finally, thank you everybody for coming. We, we come to learn something new, we come to feel inspired, but most of all, and especially for me, um, I gain a real sense of connection with everybody around the globe who's working so hard for women. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Give us some feedback and we hope we see you again next year. Goodbye. Oh, we've got a video. <laughs> I'm going to pop up a link. Um, thank you to everyone who sent their photos through. We've made a YouTube video of the attendees and I'm putting that in a link in the comment box and please go and have a look at it and look at all those beautiful faces of the people that have come and who are working for women and midwifery. Thank you. It, that was the. Have you put the link for for, for the video? I'll do that.